So we talked a bunch about politics, but mm -hmm. one of the other interesting things is that you're involved with is, uh, uh, or involved with defining the future of is journalism. I suppose you can think of podcasting as a kind of journalism, of and, but, but also just writing in general, and just whatever the hell the future of this thing looks like uh, is up to be defined by people like you. So what do you think is broken about journalism and what do you think is the future of journalism? I think the future of journalism looks much more like what we, you and I are doing here right now. And journalism is gonna be downstream from culture. That can be a good and a bad thing depending on how you look at it. We are gonna look at our media. Our media is gonna look much more like it did pre-mass media. And the way that I mean that is that back in the, 18, um, in the 1800s in particular, especially after the invention of the telegraph, when information itself was known. So for example, like you and I don't need to, let's say you and I are competing journalists. You and I are no longer competing, quote unquote, to tell the public X event happened. All journalism today is largely explaining why did X happen. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem with that is that that means that it's all up for partisan interpretation. Mm -hmm. Now you can say that that's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing because the highest level of literacy and news viewership in America was during the time of yellow journalism, mm -hmm. was during the time of partisan journalism. Not a surprise. People like to re read the news from people that they agree with. You could say that's bad, echo chambers, etc. That's the downside of it. The upside is more people are more educated. More people are interested in the news. So I think the proliferation of mass media, I mean, sorry, of this format, mm -hmm. of long form, niching, of, of not just long form. I, dude, I do I do updates on Instagram, which are five minutes. Oh, you consider yeah. like Instagram? Yeah. Oh, almost yeah. even Twitter. Oh, of course, Twitter. Twitter is where I get my news from. Yeah. I don't read the paper. I have literally, Twitter is my news aggregator. It's called my wire, where I find out about hard events, like the president has departed the White House. But not only right? that, I don't yeah. know about you, but for, I also looked at Twitter to the exact thing you're saying, which is yeah. the response to the news. Correct. Like the thoughtful Sounds ridiculous, but you yeah. can be pretty thoughtful in a single well, tweet. If you file, if you follow the right people, yeah. you can get that. And so that is the future of media, which is that the future of media is it will be much smaller amount or much larger amounts of people which are famous to smaller groups. So Walter Cronkite's never going to happen again, at least in our and probably within our lifetimes, where everybody in America know who this guy is. That that age is over. I think that's a good thing because now people are going to get the news from the people that they trust. Yes, some of it will be opinionated. I'm in my my program. I'm Crystal and I are like we are a, this. She's coming from this like view. I'm coming from this view. That's our bias when we talk about information, and we're going to talk about the information that we think is important, mm -hmm. and it has garnered a large audience. I think that's very much where the future is going to be, and the reason why I think that's a good thing is because people will be engaged more within it rather than the current system where news is highly concentrated, highly consolidated, has groupthink, has the same uh, elite production pipeline problem of everybody knows journalists all come from the same socioeconomic background and they all party together here in DC or in New York or in LA or wherever and they're part of the same monoculture and that affects what they, uh, that affects what they report. This will cause a total dispersion of all of that. The the a the battle of our age is going to be the guild versus the non guild. So like what we see right now with the New York Times and Clubhouse, this is a very, 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 very intentional thing that is happening. Which is that the Times talking about unfettered conversations that's happening on Clubhouse for people who aren't aware. This is important because. They need to be the fetters of conversation. Mm -hmm. They need to be the interagent. That's where they get their power. They get their power from convincing Facebook that they are the ones who can fact check stuff. Yeah. They are the ones who can tell you whether something is right or wrong. That battle over unimpeded conversation and the explosion of a format that you and I are doing really well in, and then this more consolidated one, which holds cultural power and elite power and more importantly, money, 
right, mm -hmm. over you and I, that's the battle that we're all going to play Do you think out. unfettered conversations have a chance to win this battle? Yes, I do in the long run. In the long run, the internet is simply too powerful. But here's the mistake everybody makes. The New York Times will never lose. It will just become one of us. See- You think so? They already are. They are the largest- The Daily? The Daily. Look at The Daily. Not even that. Think about it, not in podcasting. The Times is not a mass media product. It is a subscription product for upper middle class, largely white liberals mm. who live the same circumstances across the United States and in Europe. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. You can't be the paper of record when you're actually the paper of upper middle class white America. Your job is to report on the news from that angle and deliver them the product that they want. There's nothing wrong with that. Their stock price is higher than ever. They're making 10 times more money than they did 10 years ago, but it comes at the cost of not having a mass application audience. So like when people, I think people in our space are always like, the New York Times is gonna be destroyed. No, it's actually even better. They will just become one of us. They already are. But, They're a subscription platform. Well, yeah. yes, in terms of the actual mechanism, but right. you know, uh, New York Times is still, and I don't think I'm speaking about a particular sector. I think it, as a brand, it is. It does have the level of credibility assigned to it. Still, you know, there's politicization of it. Totally. But it, there's a credibility. Like it has much more credibility than. Forgive me, but then I think you and I have. No, no, no you're right. In, yeah. in in terms of uh, your podcast, like people are not going to be like, uh, <laughs> they're yeah. going to cite the New York Times versus right. what you said on the podcast sure. for uh, for an opinion. I, the, I wonder, in the sense of battles, whether unfettered conversations, whether Joe Rogan, whether your podcast can become the have the same level of legitimacy or the the flip side new york times loses <laughs> legitimacy to be at the same level of uh in terms of how we talk about it it's gonna long it's a long battle right it's gonna take a long time and i'm saying this is where i think the end state is going and look at what the times is doing they're leaning into podcasting for a reason but not just podcasting as in npr level like here's what's happening michael barbaro is a fucking celebrity right? The guy yeah. who does the daily, yeah. that guy's famous amongst these people. Cause they're like, Oh my God, I love Michael. Like I love the way he does this stuff. Again, that's fine. More people are listening to the news. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And then who else do they hire? Ezra Klein from Vox, yeah. uh, Kara Swisher also from Vox who does pivot, which is an amazing podcast. Um, or uh, like Jane Coaston, same thing. It's yeah. personalities who are becoming bundled together within this brand. Right. But here's, yeah. okay, maybe yeah. I'm just a hater. Because <laughs> I loved podcasting from the beginning. I loved Green Day before they were cool, <laughs> man. But I am bothered by it. Like, why doesn't Kara Swisher, she's done successfully, I think on her own, no, she was always a part of some kind of institution. I'm not sure. But she the, started her own thing, I think. It would, but recode, anyway, right, yeah. The, right, recode, right. I don't know if that's her own thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. so she, she was very successful there. Why the hell did she join the New York Times with the new podcast? Why is Michael Barbaro not do his own thing? Because he gets paid and because he has, he wants the elite cachet that you just referenced within his social circle in New York, which is that I think the biggest mistake that some of the venture people make is if we give everybody the tools that those people are all gonna leave to like go Substack and go independent, Within their social circle, sacrificing some money from being independent is worth it to be a part of the New York Times. That's sad to me because it propagates old thinking. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it propagates old institutions. And you could say that New York Times is going to evolve quickly and so on, but I would love it if there was a mechanism for reestablishing, like for building new New York Times. Mm -hmm in terms of public legitimacy. And I suppose that's uh, wishful thinking because it takes time to build trust in institutions and it takes time to build new institutions. My main thing I would say is public legitimacy as a concept is not gonna be there in mass media anymore because of the balkanization of audiences. I mean, think about it, right? Like um, this is like Legion, you know, the classic stuff around a thousand true fans or, or, or no, sorry, like a hundred true fans even now. Like you can make a living on the internet just talking to a hundred people. Yeah. If as long as they're all high frequency traders, some yeah. of the highest people, highest paid people on Substack, they don't have that many subs. 
It's just that they're Wall Street guys, right? Mm -hmm. So people pay a lot of money. Again, that's great. So what you will have is an increasing balkanization of the internet, um, of audiences and of niches. People will become increasingly famous within us. You will become astoundingly famous. I'm sure you've noticed this with your fan base. I certainly have with mine. Like 99% of the people have no idea who I am. But when somebody meets, they're like, oh my God, I watch your show every day, right? Like it's the only thing I watch yeah. for news, right? Like instead of casually famous, if that makes sense, be like, oh yeah, it's like Alec Baldwin. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, oh shit, that's Alec Baldwin. But you're not like, oh shit, I love you, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. It's this is a Ben Smith of the of, of the New York Times. Actually, he wrote this column. He's like, the future is everybody will be famous, but only to a small group of people. Yeah. And I think that is true. But again, I don't decry it. I think it's great because yeah. I think that the more that that happens, the more engaged people will be, and it empowers different voices to be able to come in and then possibly I wouldn't say destroy, but compete.